Hello everybody and welcome to the first of our webinars for 2016 and today I'm joined by Rickard Egren and he is going to be presenting a webinar called uh, Good Testers Are Often Lucky Using Serendipity in Software Testing and it's quite an interesting title here so I'm excited to see what Rickard has to say. If you have any questions for Rickard, um, please type them into the questions field on your control panel. And at the end of the webinar, we'll go through your questions one by one. And just don't forget that you can type these questions at any point. You, you don't necessarily have to wait till the end. So we look forward as well to seeing what you guys have to say. So I'm now going to hand over to Rickard. Hello, Rickard. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. This is uh, Rickard calling in from Karlstad, Sweden. And um, first I want to tell you that in the 60s and 70s, Sweden's best ice hockey goalkeeper was Leif Honken Holmqvist. He played when the uh, Soviet Union dominated, so many pucks went into goal, but he also did a lot of saves and was extremely popular. He used to say, the posts are my best friends, which is something I have carried with me all my life. The saying indicates it's about luck, but there's much more than good fortune to it. And I think it's the same with testers. I think that you and your colleagues stumble on important things, and one might say that good testers often are lucky. But it's not only luck, and that's what we will investigate in this presentation about serendipity. I had a happy childhood, pure luck, at least from my perspective. I had great friends, where I still hang around with several of them. I studied philosophy at the university without knowing the enormous benefit of the critical thinking skills it gave. I want to be a software developer, but I grabbed an opportunity to start as a tester and never looked back. I met my partner when I stopped looking for one, and we have three wonderful children, and I have no clue how they became that. A lot of things in life happen by chance. And my best trick is to create a lot of opportunities for good things to happen. Serendipity happens when you look for something but find something else that is valuable. It has been voted as one of the most difficult words to translate, which can be seen on this list on the screen. Estonian is last on the list and they make a good effort, but they haven't reached the top in ice hockey either. The most famous serendipity example is uh, when Fleming had an experiment that was a real disaster. But when he looked carefully at the distorted result, he discovered penicillin. He had an observant mind, so he could notice that the bad experiments had results worth looking deep into. And he knew enough about the subject, so he could understand that the results were important. It was luck, but it was not, not luck either, because he knew a lot about the area. I think you all agree with me that we can't test everything. Testing is in the sampling business. We test some things. But when we test things, we can be observant and notice more than what we are looking for. We can perform many rich tests in order to find more valuable information about the software. And when we do this sampling in our, the testing we do, we will also like to change the sampling strategy as we learn more in order to learn even more. So let's enlarge this image so I can explain this a bit more. What you see on the screen now is uh, it, it's a brown potato. It is my simplified view on what software is for an investigating tester. The square symbolizes the features and bugs that you will find with test cases stemming from requirements and user stories, etc. that can't and shouldn't be complete. The blue area is every possible usage, every possible bug, including things that maybe even no customers would consider a problem. This area is probably infinite if we include the user's data, environment, their needs, different kind of sequences, etc. But we are lucky, because not everything is important. So the brown area, the potato, that's what is important. There lies those problems 
that you want to find and fix. That, there's where we want to do most of our tests. Now, if we do very exact testing, hitting one pixel at a time, we will find some stuff, surely. But if we add serendipity to the mix, my theory is that we will see more than one pixel at a time. We will see more interesting things about the software and we will be lucky a lot more often. But all of this, this is not easy, thank God for that. Testers need to learn a lot from different sources. We need to combine things, we need to look at many places, think critically and design tests in advance or on the fly that will cover those important areas. And sure, some part is luck, but there is a large portion of hard work and a lot of testing wiseness as well. And my main point in this presentation is that serendipity is working to our advantage and we need to use it. One part of serendipity opportunities lies in preparations. We know what computers we are using and which test data that is involved and there are many ways to change these to make better chances for serendipitous findings. One method for this I call the error prone machine. On purpose I don't use the same settings as everyone else. Since the developers have English or Swedish settings on their machines, I use German or Japanese reading settings, so I have different date and decimal formats. I've changed my temp folder, I have the taskbar to the left of the screen, I have a friend who I've never ever installed into the default location. I use hide DPI and of course make sure to show script errors in the browser. These changes don't find problems often, but when they do, I get them for free. I also often use the background complexity heuristic, where I use more complex data than what is necessary. So if I would test the search functionality in Word, many tests could be performed with a few sentences in the document. I would often prefer to have a very complex document, maybe with 200 pages and images and footnotes and formatting, etc. This complexity is not needed, but it increases my chances of serendipity. I find more stuff because I add more stuff to the mix. I guess you have or can come up with good preparations that make your tests a bit richer. And many preparations just have to be done once, so it's often a well worth investment. Testing is about finding new information, so to run the same test over and over again is a safe strategy to be blind for new and important things. Of course, sometimes you want to do this, for instance, certain regression tests that you want to know work every day. But if you want to increase your coverage, you should do new tests, or at least new variations. It might be to use keyboard instead of mouse, it might be to do things in different order, it might be to use new kinds of data as often as possible. You can also vary how you look at your testing and the results. You can look at many places, on the screen, in the database, in log files, in code, after an export, etc. The careful observation is a key. If we don't look with a curious mind, we won't see stuff. The do one more thing heuristic is used after you have completed any test. Additionally, do something error prone or something popular or something you know that the user often do. Don't think too much, just do something and see what happens. It could be to copy data and paste in an email, it could be to press F1 to read the help, it might be to do another action that you feel is worth trying. This is a way to add more complexity and it's not for free, but almost. James Bach has a lot of material on galumphing, to do things in over-elaborated ways. This is not only because it is fun, it is because the variations will help you discover things about what you are testing. My most vivid example was a dialogue that would crash when you click cancel, but only if you first had moved the dialogue box. It was not something I did on purpose. I didn't think maybe there will be a crash on cancel if I first move the dialogue. No, it was a serendipitous finding because I unconsciously added variations by doing things I didn't have to. My favorite testing lesson comes from the book Lessons Learned in Software Testing. It's number 283. 
it is better to test pretty well in many ways than perfect in one or two. This is because important things often are missed because you looked at the software with too few approaches. You should vary how you test. So if you do mostly free-form exploratory testing, maybe specification-based tests is your next best step. This goes back to the potato. We don't want to look at just a small part of the potato or about it over time. Now let's look at some examples of serendipity in testing. When I taught testing uh, tools at the school, I showed them the Sino link checker who searches a website to see if the links are valid or not. And uh, I used their school's website as a, as a live example uh, since I like to test new things to make it more real also for myself. And as we, I browse the list and especially looking at the, the red broken links, uh, a student said, wait a minute, what's that? So I stopped and I scrolled back on his request and then he could point to what he was meaning. And what we looked at was a green valid link, uh, several of them that linked to Escort Istanbul and uh, similar places. That is not very appropriate for a school, right? So this is a serendipity example. My second example happened uh, when we tested an application for fire departments and fire risk in Sweden. There were strange results uh, near Uppsala and by visualizing the whole underlying database we could see that there were holes in the data for some municipalities in Sweden. After we had done this, this, of course, we looked some more at the data visually because we now have the tool to do it. And by doing some filtering, we noticed that there were unexpected patterns. The risks of fire were arranged according to a square-like net that you can see in this image. It's a bit, tiny bit skewed, like squares all over Sweden. And uh, that's not how reality fire risk is. It can't be arranged in that pattern. So, so we knew this was wrong, but we didn't know why. The developers didn't know why either, so all the underlying data had to be rebuilt. It's serendipity again. Quite often I open any file in a text editor. I call it a notepad heuristic. Even if it's a binary file, you can see interesting stuff. For example, that the file created as a BMP actually was a PNG file. Now and then I look at log files for no particular reason, just to see if something interesting shows up. Another recent story is when I did performance tests. And the guy with the admin control, he thought the server had lost control, so he took it down. And this was a very good thing, because then we could see that the, the legal traceability that needed to happen would continue when the server was restarted. And it worked. So, and this was great. But when we looked more carefully at the data that was being logged, we could see that the timestamp was the time when sending this uh, request. It was not the viewing time, which is what should be stored in this context. So this was an important find that needed to be fixed in the product. And I wish I could promise that this would have been covered anyway, but serendipity may be not having to find out. And a pattern I can see in the testing that I do is that I, I try to perform many tests fast with different kinds of data. And I rarely write out the details in advance and I look for many things at once. It might seem a bit unstructured, well, even to me, but I learn a lot about the software and I can write down what I have tested afterwards and show the coverage that I have done. I think and I hope that I set up situations where serendipity can work to my advantage. Serendipity is not something you do, it is something that happens. And one way to make that happen more often is to have many ongoing test ideas for your product. Things that you don't need to think about, but when a violation occurs you will notice it. Spelling errors is a typical example. And many others can be found by elaborating on quality characteristics. Things we know always matter can be tested almost for free and this will make your testing richer. So what you see on screen now is a, is a very long list for, of about quality characteristics and you can uh, download it for free. Just Google software quality characteristics. 
Uh, it's a list that I wrote together with uh, Martin Johnson and Henrik Emelsson, and it's a thorough extension in the same spirit as James Bach's quality criteria in the heuristic test strategy model. And the way to use it is to think about different areas and think about your product and find out what that really means in your unique situation. If you know what reliability and usability means for you, what aspects of that is important in your situation, then you can spot problems about that, whatever you are testing. If you know your charisma, you can spot the violation in a corner that few others will examine. All of these characteristics have more details to them, and they mean different things for each unique product. And if you find out the house of your product, I can almost promise that you will get more serendipity in your daily testing. I, I didn't say I promise, I say I can almost promise. It's at least worth trying. A guy called Daniel Leesman wrote an article about serendipitous findings for librarians when they do research, which has been very helpful for my material. A key point that he makes is, who wants to admit they found this by chance? And this is valid for testers as well, and I think it is the reason why serendipity isn't more widely talked about and accepted. That's why most testing techniques come from computer books. That's why we often create a lot of seemingly impressive documentation. It's not easy to say, well, we learn as much as possible, so when we see the software in action, we will stumble on the most important things. But if we don't talk about this serendipity, we won't get better at it. And if it helps us, why should we hide it? Leesman talks about perseverance. A tester that also does hard and boring work will have greater chances of serendipity. Testing is fun, but not always, and the perseverance is needed to do many tests, also the boring ones, and eventually good things will happen. Otherwise, we might have a faulty test strategy. Hush is a rarely used word about your hidden heuristics and invisible skills. I see it as a part of testing's tacit knowledge, things we know how to do but can't really explain. For example, when we decide to continue the testing but from another angle. We get new ideas as we see the software in action, and this grows from experience, but also from interacting with other testers and discussing what you do. It's also about sagacity, the ability to make good decisions. The more you know, the better chances you have for this. Connect observation and experience. For instance, when we notice an odd behavior that really has to be investigated more deeply. Surrounding all of this is an understanding about what is important. But to say, learn a lot is quite fluffy, so let's give this a bit more flesh. And we do this by, by filling the potato with things like creating many models that enhance our understanding and testing ideas. We explore the data in all its forms. We learn about the underlying technologies and tools to explore them. We learn about the business, so we understand the user's true purposes. We have conversations with many people. We discuss with other people. We get ideas from ourselves, from other products, from other people. And all of this together gets an understanding about what is important about the software that I test. And that's what enables good testing. And it also enables a lot of serendipity. The more we know, the more value you get from just using the software. Here are some serendipity quotes that I like. The first one by Yogi Berra is spot on. You can see a lot by just looking. And also the opposite. If you don't look, you won't see anything. Strauss and Corbin are social scientists in the grounded theory tradition. They point to one of the reasons why I think testing is so fascinating. We have a lot of good ideas, but the unexpected serendipitous findings are really exciting. Louis Pasteur puts emphasis on your prepared mind, your mind that knows a lot and that also is ready to see new and interesting things. If you don't expect to see new things, you won't see them. Taleb's quote about maximum tinkering and recognizing opportunities comes from the book The Black Swan and is spot on to my message. 
positive black swans happens, but you have to allow yourself tinkering and playing around, and you need to have the ability to recognize opportunities when they show up. And I love computers and tools, but we need to know the strengths and beware of the weak spot that has implications for software testing. We need to know that humans can do more. Computers are marvelous, but they suck at serendipity. To stimulate your own thinking, I think you can say to your colleagues, wouldn't it be interesting to, and then you force yourself to suggest a way of testing that enables serendipity and finding out new interesting stuff. Since, since this is a webinar, we need to keep it short and crisp so you have focus all the time and don't want to do other things. So it's already time for the summary. I hope you have gotten some tips on how to embrace serendipity in your daily practice. I hope that you can dare to say that sometimes I found things by chance. Because if you dare to say that, maybe that will enable you to get a bit of more free space because those valuable things are so valuable that we need them. To me and all testers, I know serendipity is quite common and it is working to our advantage. Uh, once I I played a game with myself, so I noted down, noted down every time I found what I was looking for and every time I found a bug that I didn't look for. And it was like 50-50 bugs that I was looking for and bugs that I found by chance. And that might say something about my test design technique, but it also says something that you see a lot that you aren't expecting. And it's still important bugs. So we want that to happen. And I will end this with some fluffy words that you need to work out the details for yourself. Learn a lot, prepare, do many tests, and observe. So, this was my talk, and after Dara takes over, I will try to answer your questions. And maybe I will learn important things I didn't know I was looking for when having this webinar. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ricard, for, for that great presentation. Um, I'm just going to open on my screen again here. I just have one or two slides to go through myself. Okay, and you should see my screen there in, in a second. There you go. So we have a few more webinars this week. We have a webinar taking place on Thursday with Bob Galen and Mary Thorne, and they will be looking at acceptance test-driven development and behavior-driven development. And this will take place at 2 p.m. And we have another webinar on Thursday or Friday at 2 p.m. as well. And this is on digital transformation, testing, and automation. And that will be presented by Paul Girard. Now, another thing to note about this coming Friday is our call for submissions deadline is coming on Friday, this Friday. So if you haven't already submitted to speak at Eurostar 2016, make sure you get your submission in. And we're delighted with the amount of submissions we've got so far. There's there's lots there. So we're, we're looking forward to getting a few more in. Um, but to find out more details, just go to the Eurostar website. And also I want to point out too, that if you click on the Eurostar blog, there's a few different blog posts there that will help you with your submission. There's some resources that are, are very valuable. Now, finally, let's have a look at some of your questions that have come through. The first question I have here, Ricard, says, how do you differentiate adding complexity and scope creep? Mm, I'm not sure I understand the question because Scope creep for me is a term used when features are added into development. So that will be a different thing. But if you think scope creep as in that my testing scope increases, then I can answer the question. Um, I wouldn't say that the scope increases in my test. I will still test the same things, but I will just look a bit more wider. I will just look a bit more outside this stuff. It will cost me a little bit of time, but I think it's worth it. And if it's something I find that this is important and we need to test it, then it is something that should be added to the, to the scope of the testing. And if I am on an extreme time pressure and I want to test more things, then I need to have a discussion with the, with the people I'm doing the testing for. So I can tell them that I found a, a really interesting area around here 
uh, I want to pursue this, but I will not have time to finalize the other things. What do you say? I Myself, I think this should be done, and I think we can skip that one because that risk is lower than the risk of these new things. And then we have a discussion about it, and uh, and we can make an informed decision about what to, what to focus on. But for the, the normal adding complexity and, and looking elsewhere, I <clears throat> I don't see it as, as a burden. It's not. Uh, it just hangs around, and I do it at the same time as everything else. So it's uh, it's just 10 seconds here or 20 seconds there, uh, and uh, it will add to my motivation and uh, my fun. So I will probably save time because I will have a better energy and a better drive when I do my testing. At least that's how it works for me. That was my answer. Okay, let's let's have let's have another look at some more questions here. Um, another question here asks, how does serendipity help in increased quality with minimum effort? Well, the, the most the the thing how it helps is that I find important problems that uh, we want to fix. That's how it helps, and the minimum effort is just be prepared for serendipity. If you are expecting serendipity to happen, if you know that I'm now going to test this, but I am totally ready to find something else, that's no extra effort. It's just a, a mental preparation. Of course, you will have the extra effort of reporting the bug, but if I would rather find these bugs than not finding them at all. So the minimum effort is to just be ready for serendipity, just to have a more open eyes, learn a bit more about the software and what is around what you're testing. Good question, both of them. There's another question here that asks, how often do you vary your environment, for example, change language on your computer? Uh, very rarely. I uh, almost always use German because <laughs> The, the developers are not using German, they are using uh, Swedish or English. And uh, when uh, I worked for a company that where Japan was an important uh, market, then I used uh, Japanese computer, total Japanese. And it also de it, uh, it depends on, on what I'm testing. So right now, I, the, it's uh, the variety in platforms is not that important. But at the project I worked earlier, it was really important. So then I switched the platform every day that I used. So I had my normal machine that I took notes and did my reporting and stuff on. And then I had two test machines uh, where I had uh, different operating systems and different uh, office versions and different language, etc. But for this, uh, the error pro machine that I talked about, uh, I don't. I rarely change those stuff. I've, I've done it a long time ago, and it just keeps keeps on like that. The next question here um, asks, how do you budget time for testing, explorative versus planned? Uh, I uh, have a discussion with the one who wants me to do the testing about uh, what they want to have tested and what the goals are and what they are afraid of and uh, what kind of bugs they had before or examples of risk they have heard from the developers etc uh, etc et so I, I get an understanding of what is important and then I, I tell them what my strategy for this is and if the strategy is, is to use only exploratory testing or only testing with tools or only manual script tested, that will differ depending on what kind of product it is. Quite often it's, it's a mix of different, different methods to test because different methods will find different things. So what I will do is that I will have a, a strategy that outlines my, the main activities, what, what, what I want to accomplish and how I want to do it. And then we'll have a discussion about that. We'll understand even more about what they find important. So I know that what I test is really important because I don't want to test something where no one is interested in res results because then my testing wasn't worth anything. 
the results need to be communicated and uh, and someone need to learn something from the either to fix a bug or to have a better confidence in the product or whatever it's uh, the results need to to mean something uh, nowadays i often have uh, i have a good relation with the one who who pays for the testing so i don't have to to plan like every day or every hour where to do it's like a milestone could be a week away or two weeks away uh, where we want something to be accomplished so i don't need to 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 pinpoint every activity and how much time it should be so i can um, i can change how much i do explore it or not or how much i use a performance test tool or not uh, depending on on the results and uh, and my uh, evaluation of, of the current risks and, and what kind of testing is, is worth most at the moment. So I guess I'm a bit lucky there that I don't have to to spit out all the details, but uh, that's how I do it and, and that was the question about and I, I can say how you should do it, but uh, have a conversation with the one who, who pays for the testing about what is important and then you say you are the one who know how you can test in order to find get as much value as possible, but then they may might have other uh, requirements like uh, every test uh, we need to document the testing we have done so we can show it to an external customer, and then you might say okay then we 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 want to write the test cases that we run, or you might say okay we will do exploratory testing and then we will document afterwards what we have done. And we will not document the details because no one wants to read them. We'll just document the one-liner test studies. That will be perfect for them so they understand uh, what we tested and can reuse it for a similar purpose. So um, a discussion about what is important and the ways you think you can accomplish those goals. That's uh, what I would recommend. Good question. Okay. Um I have another question here. It's it's quite a long question, so I'll repeat it if you if you need me to. Um, and the question that was asked here is: How can we advocate for serendipity when cutting costs and supporting fast delivery is in the mandate? If I ask the testers to explore the serendipity, I am adding more time to test as I am allowing them to spend time playing around. And uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I would say that uh, the small scale serendipity comes for free. That's when you just you are just open to serendipity. You have done you change the test data from time to time, and you you look at a bit more places. It's it's almost for free, so it doesn't add any cost. It might add cost to the project if you find a, a, a showstopper bug that threatens the value of the whole product. That would be a cost. But wouldn't that be a good idea to find instead of finding it after you have released it and the customers go to a competitor? So I would say that the small scale serendipity, and that's a new term that uh, I invented now, uh, that's, that doesn't cost anything. Any, any tester can do it. Uh, regardless if you are testing exploratory with test cases or if you're running in a big automation suite and you look at the screen at the same time or whatever you do, some serendipity can always be there. If you want to to uh, make a bigger effort about it, if you find things by chance quite a lot and you realize, wow, there is more strange stuff here, we need to investigate more openly in order to find out what this product really is about, uh, then that would be uh, a bigger effort. Then you need to have a discussion about uh, uh, what you focus on. And then you will have, probably have a problem if cut costs and fast delivery is uh, priority one. Uh, and then you need to have a balanced discussion about what kind of bugs are really important and what kind of bugs are not. Because if you serendipity find bugs that they aren't really important and we don't really need to fix it then it's not worth a lot. Maybe the, your normal testing also doesn't find really big stuff. Then it's not really important. So you need also need to understand what are the managers afraid of? What kind of bugs do they really want to find now? And then you can focus on ways to find that. And um, one method that I try to do 
is that I try to not test in the same way all the time. Uh, and that can also be actually a way to cut cost. Because it's quite often that this cut cost fast delivery means that you will do the exact same testing over and over again. And you don't find anything new. You only find the false positives in your automated tests, uh, strange things in the configuration of the test environments, etc. Uh, you can cut costs by not only do that every third time. And uh, the other times you do totally open uh, serendipitous testing. And the other ones you do totally focused testing on this tiny part of the functionality that you know is important. So uh, it's always a trade-off, right? So if you really believe that some kind of testing will have more value than other ones, then suggest that you skip the other thing and do this new thing that you believe is more worth. And of course, there could also be situations where uh, this serendipity really doesn't add so much value. Uh, for instance, I have, a, I have a friend who is a developer and he works with uh, uh, its a credit card uh, information that is sent. And they have, uh, it's, there is no UI at all. Uh, and everything they do needs to be automatically tested and they need to prove every now and then that all these tests run. So they have an enormous amount of tests that run unattended and um, they, they don't have use for a serendipitous tester in their project. They don't need it. And that might also be the case. It's not like the serendipity I, I suggest is the solution to all testing problems in the world. But uh, what I'm saying is that it's something that for a lot of testers, it can mean that you add more value than you currently do if you are open to seeing new stuff. And it doesn't have to cost a lot. Just be ready for it and open your eyes and make a bit of preparations and learn a few more things. Good question. The next question I have here, they're asking, uh, what is the difference in testing for product and application? Oh, that's a hard one because I don't. I would ask the person, what do you mean with the product and what do you mean with an application? Um, what, I, what I can do is that I, I can invent something that might not be correct and then I make up an answer. I, maybe a product is a, a desktop uh, thick uh, product that you install and run and an application is uh, a web application. Uh, to me, uh, the difference is uh, almost none at all. The difference lies in the, the technology and, uh, and the, some risks that might be involved. But uh, my main testing attitude is to learn about the software and test if it does what it should do and doesn't do what it shouldn't do and learn about quality characteristics and other stuff that are important and try to find out information about this. Uh, it's uh, basically the same for both situations. It's just the technology, and the technology might mean that there are other tools you need to use, uh, etc. Maybe applications mean a, a mobile app, and there you definitely have other kinds of tools to use. But uh, the th thinking that you do as a tester, and how you look at things, and that you look at many places and stuff like that, it's still the same uh, for me when I test. Let's have a look at another question that's come in here. And this question asks, how effective do you think serendipity is in agile projects? I would say that it's uh, very effective. I would say that it's, it fits even better in agile projects. Because I believe that serendipity help you find important information fast. And to get fast feedback is what Agile is about. Um, so yes, fits, fits well. The next question says, is there any common field for automated testing and serendipity? Yes, uh, very good question. Uh, that's actually, that could be another talk that I or someone else should do. It should be about uh, manual testing, uh, exploratory manual testing with serendipity while creating automated tests. Because when you create automated tests, 
the bugs that you find, you find when you create the tests. The first test you write, you need to learn about the product, you need to read documentation, you need to uh, try different stuff and you will see stuff, you will understand stuff. So if you really explore uh, the product at the same time as you write your automated tests and you do it with a serendipitous mind, you will discover a lot of things. So for creating the automation, it fits perfectly fine in. Uh, it happens, at least to me, all the time that I, I, I just want to make that script run, but when I do that, I, I find that, wow, I did this mistake and that strange thing happened. Uh, I didn't mean to, to do a spelling error, but what happened is that it, it broke down totally. It should do that. It should, grace, uh, uh, it should fail gracefully. And so I, and many I know, find a lot of stuff while doing automation. Uh, if we're talking about automation when it is being run, uh, if it's being run unattended every day, uh, there is no serendipity for, for a computer. A computer can re it can only see what you tell it to see. But if you, if you try to do some semi-automation, uh, for instance, that uh, maybe you have some tests that run and you can look at stuff while the tests are being run, you can look at the log files or look at the UI or something and see what happens, you can look at that at the same time as the test run. That will cost the time that you do that, but you might see stuff that the computer doesn't see. So there are other ways. And also, uh, it's in the, in the talking of testing, it's too much like automation is one thing and other testing is another thing. It should be more uh, mixed together because uh, you, you want, often you want to have both of them and they help each other. So you should do some kind of semi automated testing tool assisted with a thinking tester that sees stuff and stuff like that. So yes, they uh, definitely go together. My next question says, um, how has the use of serendipity in your test approach been received by project stakeholders? Is this something you are open about? It depends on what kind of project I'm working at. It would, it's not something that I say the first thing I do. Hey, I found things by chance. That's not what I say. I talk about what they want to find out and, and then I do my best testing in order to find out that information. Uh, so that's not the first thing I say. Uh, not that I hide it, but it's not something I, I really uh, put up at first meeting. To many customers, I won't say anything about that at all. I will just test with an open mind and some things I find by chance and it's a good thing. Uh, if they ask me, like, how did you find that kind of bug? Then I would say, yeah, actually, it was kind of luck. It's kind of serendipity. But it was not only luck because, you know, when I do these tests, I change the data all the time. So now I run with 50 different data sets and what's on this 50th one that we find this problem? So if I hadn't changed so often, I wouldn't have found it. But it was luck. On the other hand, it was the preparations and my openness and that I looked carefully that made me find it. In a, another example I have was when I worked at a product company uh, where we we used the concept that we, we, we call it that one person every week had a totally free role. We were eight people in the test team and one of the eight had no responsibilities whatsoever on a week and then we rotated. So every eight week you would have no responsibility whatsoever on what you tested. You were free to pursue anything you wanted. It could be to test an area that you want to test. It could be to look into some support incidents that happened recently. It might be to investigate a new test tool. It could be whatever. And this was something we were very open with, uh, with the managers about that. This is something we do. And they say, yeah, you can do it. And the reason they said it was that we could show examples of good things that this helped us do. Because we started doing it uh, by our own without asking for it, so we just did it. And then we found, we found big bugs, we found new tools to use, we found, we created better test data, etc. So we, we knew that 
by not having the responsibility but having the freedom to do whatever you want and the responsibility to use your time wisely, we would create value that we didn't know about in advance but were, were important to, to the product as a whole. So that's why we were allowed to do it because it, we could show examples of how it helped us. Good question. Let's take a look at a, another question here. And this person is asking, what is the best percentage of the whole app that should be covered by automated test cases? 44? Is that okay? 65? <laughs> 10? 100? No, it, that's impossible. Uh, impossible question. Um, I agree with Adam Page from Microsoft. He says uh, you should automate 100% of the tests that should be automated. So the difficult thing is to realize what kind of tests should be automated. You should, you should not automate tests that you only want to run uh, a couple of times. That's not worth it. You should uh, Automate stuff that you really, really need to know that they work and you want to test them in almost the same way all the time. That's something to automate. You should automate things that are easy to automate. Uh, an API is easy to automate. It's robust. A graphical user interface is fragile. And uh, I uh, don't want to go there unless I really, really had to. A manual tester can do faster uh, regression testing than a tool can do. Just uh, the cost of maintaining the GUI regression is higher than a manual person looking at the product and understanding it. So the percentage, uh, it could be, I, I can say it like this, it will be something between zero and 100 percent. But in most ambitious companies regarding testing, they do a lot of automation and they do a lot of manual testing. And, uh, and you often want to have both of them if what the product does is very important. If what the product does isn't important at all, then maybe you don't need to test at all either. So it depends on, on the situation. And it's often difficult uh, on a high level when you, you get into a project, we should do it like that. You need to understand a bit more about what the product is and what kind of opportunities are and what are the risks involved and stuff like that. But once you really understand what you're trying to do, then I think it's often, it's not a problem to understand if this is a good candidate for automation or not, or if this should be tested at all or not, or if this should be tested a lot or not. Once you understand the details and the risks involved, it's, it's not that difficult. The difficult thing is to get that information so you really understand what it's all about. So, so my answer is between zero and 100%. Next question, uh, what support do you need from others such as developers, managers, etc. for serendipity? Um, the more information you have, the better the chances you have of serendipity. So the more conversations you can have, uh, if the developers tell you uh, there might be something fishy with the authentication, that's, a, that's something where you will look at that now and then. So the more information you get, the more chances. Uh, there might also be that you need some support from the managers to pursue new stuff. If you have a manager that tells you that I want you to run exact these 20 test cases every day and you, have to, you are not allowed to do anything else and if you find a bug outside the test cases we will ignore them, then it's no point in looking at other stuff and having serendipity because they will be it will be ignored. So you need to have a uh, manager that understands what you do and they maybe they need to understand that testing is a sampling problem that you don't test everything you do samples and you need to want to look at different places. Maybe you want to show them the potato so you can understand that now we want to look at from this angle or from this angle. So um, uh, trust between the different parties in both directions and, uh, and uh, conversations is what you need in order to, to get good at this. Good question. The next question here is asking, do you often have problems finding the root of the problem since you are using multiple different setup changes? 
i.e. do you have problem reproducing the errors and what do you do to avoid this problem? It's a very good question. I actually thought about saying something about this in the presentation uh, because if you, what I'm saying is that you, you should vary your test and do many different things and you don't have total control so it might be a problem to reproduce it. But my experience is that if I know the product really well I will have no problems reproducing it. Uh, when I test the product for years uh, I knew so much so I understood what it would be. I would be able to reproduce it. If it is something new to me that I don't know too much about, then it can be more difficult to reproduce it. But if I can't do it, then often it can help to explain to someone what happened or to show them a, a screen capture. Uh, and to a developer, you might say, oh, I know why that happens. It must be this thing. Let me have a look at that. Yeah, I knew it was suspicious when I wrote it, but I forgot about it. Thank you, thank you. I'll fix it right away because they understand the clues I give. If you're really worried about this, then you can use uh, tools that record the actions that you do. It's uh, built in in Windows, for example. There you can, it records what you did all the time, so you, you can go back and look at it. For me, often it takes more time to go back to it than to actually figure out what happened, but uh, if, if you are afraid of this, then that could be an option. You can also take notes while you do your testing uh, at an appropriately high level so you know what you did, that you know what kind of test data you have, and stuff like that. So if it's a problem, it's, it's solvable. And I think it's better to have that problem than to not finding the bug in the first place. Okay, we're almost out of time here, Rickard. So I'll just take one more question. And this question here says, Considering the efforts put in for serendipity, will it eventually decrease the regression efforts? I don't really understand what regression efforts mean in this situation, but um, I, I don't think it's a lot of effort that I put into this. I mean, just the mindset to be ready to see something, that's totally for free. Uh, to look at a few more places now and then, it's a minute here, a minute there. To change my machine, yeah, cost me one hour three years ago. To pursue important things I see, that's where it starts to cost things. But then it's awful, it's, it's worth doing it because I see something that's interesting and, I, and my experience and understanding tells me that this is important I need to look more into it. Uh, if I pursue everything I see and I pursue even small tiny things that are really not important to anyone, then it will not be good. Then I will not uh, provide value with my testing. So I need to have some kind of feeling and it, I need to be right at least now and then so I don't spend time looking for uh, problems that will uh, no one will bother about them. Um, so that was the question was also about regarding uh, regression effort, uh, and that indicates that it's about regression testing maybe. But uh, well, I don't really understand what it means. But yes, it can take time for one things. But you also need to ask that other thing: is that more important than the new thing that you discovered? A lot of time. As testers, we do, do the same thing as we always have done, and it is not a good strategy. But we do it because it uh, it's a safe strategy. No one can uh, can say that. Wow, how come you did the same testing as you did last time? It's it's reasonable to do the same thing as last time, but often it's a waste of time because you you will probably find something same things as last time and you will find no new information and then it's not worth so much. Sometimes you need to do the testing. You really, really need to do the testing. But I myself, I've been in situations where once, two times every year, I test an area and I knew that I would find the same bugs that I found the last time. I was 100% sure and I did the testing and I found the same problems as last time and they weren't fixed this time either and then I repeated the same thing next year. Uh, and I thought about that and it, it was 
a bit of fear and I was afraid if we skip this and something bad happens then we have failed but at the same time it's, it was like one specific area I remember it was like four hours of work that I was 100% sure that uh, we wouldn't find any new information but still we did it and I think we often do that we do the same things as we did last time and uh, we know we won't find any in important information so why do we do it maybe we can cover it in another way maybe we can cover the same functionality area with new uh, glasses and look from a different perspective if something important is broken we will notice it that way okay so that was the last question I, I'm just very happy that I got so many good questions it really uh, inspired me and helped me to find out new stuff so thank you Yes, there is, there is a huge range of questions coming in there, Ricard, and I'm sure we could go on all day with, with these questions, but unfortunately we have to, to wrap things up. Um, apart from the questions too, there was a lot of really great feedback there. The Hannah Kuma said thanks a lot. Uh, Peter Ferguson was saying thank you, Ricard. That was illuminating. And Jeremy Winch, I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, said terrific presentation. Uh, thank you very much. So I'd like to join them as well in thanking you today, Ricard, for taking time out to present this webinar and all of our attendees who've come along. We have some more webinars coming up this week too, so you'll find out all the information on those on the Test Huddle website um, and finally on screen there as well. Just a reminder about our call for submissions deadline is this Friday, so make sure you check it out and uh, don't miss out. And we hope to see you all in Stockholm. That's it for today. Thank you very much and take care. Bye. -bye.